Hi, this is Rob Packard from Medical Device Academy, and this video is about IEC TIR 8002-1. It's a 2009 guidance document from AAMI, or Technical Information Report, explaining how to apply the risk management standard 14971 to software as a medical device and software in a medical device. Software is a little bit, di bit different animal on how to apply risk management and hazard analysis than devices that don't have software. So it's important to read this particular guidance document for examples on what are hazards and how to go about controlling them. What kinds of testing would be appropriate for verification and validation of those risk controls that you've implemented? What I see from most companies is we've developed an app, great, and it works. How do we get a, get a 510K for this? No. <laughs> Number one, you need to document the software validation of that. For that, you need IEC 62304. And then one of the documents that's part of that software validation documentation is your hazard analysis. And when companies come to me a list with a list of five hazards, and they're very superficial, and they say, well, there really isn't anything that could hurt anybody in this device, they're really not understanding how to document hazards for software. You can create a hazardous situation rather than actual harm. And that also needs to be addressed in your hazard analysis and in your risk controls for your software and in the actual verification testing you perform. And if it's not there, it's gonna get rejected by the regulator and you're gonna to have to redo your documentation. The bigger problem is what if you didn't address that risk at all or that hazard at all in your design, and if you have to add additional risk controls to the de design of your software or completely redesign the software because you didn't address that risk. Now you've got a much bigger problem. It's not just going to be a delay. You're going to have to rewrite your code, and that's going to cost you many, many months. So it's absolutely critical that you do this hazard analysis and you want to do it early in your development process so those become software requirement specifications to address each hazard. So if you don't know what the hazards are, you can't identify it as a software requirement and therefore you won't develop code that addresses those risks and you will fail any validation you perform for it. If you're lucky, you'll get through any kind of bug testing you're doing or any performance testing and you'll squeak by the FDA, but then you're gonna have customers that identify that as a problem later and you're gonna have to address it later as a patch or an update of your software. And that's not gonna be any better for you because people are gonna be associating your product with uh, with problems and faults and bugs. And that, that won't help you with selling your software or making any money. You need to make sure that you address these upfront. So it, it behooves you to go out and do this software hazard analysis before you do your development of code. So let me share this my screen here to show you the different standards. This first one is IEC 62304. I'm showing you the EVS.EE version that we purchased from the Estonian Standards Organization. It's the cheapest source that we found to purchase different medical device standards from. If they're a European standard, we can usually get it here less expensively, and we can buy a multi-user license so we can print out a hard copy and share it amongst our team. So that's the version that we purchased. This is the amended version from 2015, and it's an 86-page document. If you want to learn more about this, you can click on the link below in the software, I'm sorry, in the video description. I give a link to Matthew Walker's video on what is IEC 62304. But I'm going to give you a little sneak peek uh, before we move on here. I'm going to show you what's in this standard. So here's the table of contents. And usually what people are interested in if they're starting out on a new product is this software development process, section five. So it gives you some of the different documents and steps that are involved in software um, validation and the documentation of it. But then in addition to that, if we scroll down, I'm going to go, I think, to page 41 here. Here we go. Um, table A1 gives you a summary of the requirements by software risk classification. For software, we have class A, class B, and class C. Not to be confused with the classifications of IBDs, which are also A, B, C, or risk classifications 1, 2, 3. This is software class A, software class B, and class software class C. Class C software is typically a high-risk item 
It could be an implantable medical device. It could be a pacemaker. It could be an artificial heart. It could be something that could cause serious injury or death and isn't implantable. But those types of devices, even an AED, the life supporting or um, going to save your life, those devices are class C. And usually we don't run across companies that are developing a class C software in aren't familiar with this standard. They usually already know this standard and usually they already know IEC TIR 8002-1 and they use that as the starting point for their hazard analysis. So if you're not familiar with this guidance document and you're working on a class C, you've got a lot of work to do, but that very rarely happens. The class A, that's the lowest risk. Not all the requirements are checked off. So there are many things that aren't required for a class A device these are the lowest risks. The definition says for class A that it can't cause any harm. That also means that you shouldn't have a device that can create a hazardous situation where harm could be caused as well. So a lot of times companies say, well, it's software, it can't cause harm, but it creates a hazardous situation that could result in harm. So therefore, when you have diagnostic functions or therapeutic functions and it's guiding those, it's a support tool those are going to be class B devices, even when you think they're class A software. So uh, anything pretty much that's getting C marking review, or it's going to be a 510K submission, it's probably going to be a class B software. And you're probably going to have a moderate level of risk. There are a few that are minor level of risk, but that is not necessarily a class A. It's usually a class B. So all these check boxes, there are only a few of them that don't apply for a class B. So that might be helpful to you. And it's one of the things you have to define up front in your software quality system. Do you have class A, B, or C? If you only have one of the classes, you can write your procedure for that. If you have multiple classes, you have to write procedures that are more flexible and cover all three classes of software. Now we're going to get on to the other software uh, guidance document. So I'm going to go to the beginning of this. This is the AMI version of TIR 8002-1-2009. And this is how to apply ISO 14971 to medical device software. So if you look at the table of contents for this software, um, let me get to that. I think it's here in the introduction, maybe a little bit before that. There we go. So in the table of contents, they're giving you the different sections of the standard and they follow along with 14971. So wherever you had a requirement in 14971, they copied what was in the 2007 version of that standard. And then right below it, they show what um, how they recommend you address that in software documentation um, for your device. So here's an example. Section 4.1, the risk analysis process. This is exactly what's in 14971. And then right below it, they explain how to perform that for software. And they do the same thing for all the other sections, like risk evaluation here, same thing. Risk reduction, they have a copy of the clause and then they describe it. In this case, they're referring you to another section where they describe it further. Um, right here, section choosing risk control options for complex systems. So this might be an embedded system um, or a complex software with multiple modules or multiple features. Now, if you look a little bit further down the table of contents of this um, standard, they have other sections where um, in probably the most valuable section of this entire document is Annex B. In Annex B, they give examples of things that can go wrong in software, and they give you examples of um, hazards that you should be putting in your hazard analysis, and they also give you examples at the very end in the last table in, section, in Annex B of how you would verify that your risk controls are adequate for your software hazards. So every single possible issue that can happen with software They've identified a potential hazard that could occur. They've explained what the examples or causes are for these hazards in questions that you should be asking. And it, it isn't just one page. This is why I say like a little section of five lists, uh, five hazards is not enough. We're on page two now. They're still listing hazards and they have them organized by section. Here's page three. 
here's page four, here's page five, page six. So the table doesn't end for six pages. It gives you six pages of software hazards that you should be considering as potential hazards for your software. Now, not all of them might apply, but before you say we don't have any security concerns, the FDA has its own questions that it asks to make sure that there aren't any cybersecurity risks for your software. So for example, if you have any Wi-Fi connection, any ethernet connection, you have any USB ports where somebody can push something in and connect it, those are all things that are gonna cause potential security concerns for your software. So you need to make sure that you've thought about all these thoroughly and documented your justification for why it's not applicable or included in your hazard analysis. If it's not applicable, it would make sense in your hazard identification document to say, we considered the possibility of security hazards, but we couldn't, we don't believe these are applicable and here's why, and provide a justification. That's the right way to do this. So make sure that you go through each one and explain why it's not applicable or included in your hazard analysis. Once you've identified all the hazards, then you're going to need to identify what is the possible effect of that hazard, and you're gonna to have to propose potential risk controls and decide which risk control would be the most appropriate. So they go through the different software causes here and risk control measures that you might implement to address each of these common side effects of software errors. And then if we go on to the last table, table B3, we talk about methods to facilitate the assurance that your risk controls are adequate. So this would be your verification testing. And I just talked with a client today and he said, we've already done our software validation. We've made sure it works. Well, that's functional testing. Did you do any of these other tests? And I'm sure that half of these he's never even heard of before. So no, you haven't done enough yet. This won't be enough to just show that your software works. You have to put in, um, for example, a boundary value analysis. You're going to put in numbers that are purposely at the edge or just beyond the edge of a normal range of numbers that you would put in there and see if it gives you an error or not. And does it fail in an unsafe way or does it fail in a safe way? So those are the kinds of things that you need to address in your verification testing. You might want to develop automated tests so you can run them very quickly on a repetitive way. So I made a change. Let's rerun this verification test to see if we caused a new problem or it's still fixed or if we eliminated the problem. It's important to do those types of verification tests and automate them wherever you can so they're always done the same way. So that's an example of what you'll find in Annex B. They have other things, uh, Annex C, potential software-related pitfalls. So they give you some examples here related for, to 14971. They talk about the life cycle uh, risk management grid. So different risks that occur at different life cycles in your software development. Some of them, uh, some of the stages you're going to apply the same thing across the board like you do in this section in planning. In other sections, you're going to do different things depending on what stage of the life cycle you're in. You're going to do different things. So I hope this helps you understand why this is going to be so important. But to give you one little last piece of, to sort of show you how this is an issue, if I identify a potential hazard in my documentation after I've developed my product, and I say, oh, I need a risk control for this. Here are some potential risk controls. Oh, I didn't implement any of those because I didn't think this error would occur. I didn't think this software fault would occur. What should I do? Well, for whenever you have a potential hazard you identified, the FDA and the notified bodies are gonna expect that you've identified a risk control, you've done verification testing, and they're gonna to wanna to know where the report is. That traceability is required. There's a traceability matrix that's required for submission. That's part of your software validation documentation. So if you don't have all the hazards identified, then in the early part of the development, you might not have included a risk control in the design of the software. So now you're stuck doing a tap dance to try to explain why you don't need it when you probably do. So it's really important to make sure 
you identify the hazards early in the process before you start development. It's okay to develop an algorithm, but don't develop your whole entire code before you've done a hazard analysis. Develop your algorithm, see if you can come up with something that you think is really gonna perform well, and then develop code around it. And in between those two steps, do your hazard analysis and make sure each of those hazards has a risk control that's identified as a software requirement specification. And you flush out how that software um, risk control is gonna be implemented in your SDS, your software design specification. Um, one last thing I know, I, I can't figure, remember which page it's on right now, um, but I do know that in this document, they actually had a fault tree. So in uh, a blog that I'm posting on later today, there's going to be a section on how to perform a hazard analysis. When you perform a risk analysis and you try to estimate risks, one of the things that the FDA is adamant about is you're not allowed to um, reduce risk by saying this is the probability of occurrence. They don't want you to be considering the probability of occurrence in your risk analysis. They only want you to look at the severity of potential harm. So therefore, the more appropriate tool than doing an FMEA or a design FMEA would be to use a fault tree. This is a much better tool. It's a top-down approach. It makes it easier to work backwards whenever you have a complaint or uh, somebody from technical support heard, hey, I think we have a bug. You can work backwards from the fault or complaint that you've had this failure with the software back to what might have caused it if you have a fault tree. Whereas if you had done um, more of a bottom-up approach with an FMEA, it's harder to use that. And the FMEA is designed to have this um, estimation of probability of occurrence. And you'd, you'd have to just basically delete that column and not include that in the calculations. So it doesn't look right. It's not what people expect for um, an FMEA. Whereas if you have a fault tree analysis, it actually is more useful for how you're actually going to use your risk analysis in the future. And it, it kind of lends itself to making sure, do we have traceability in this module for each of the possible things that can go wrong, all the hazards up to um, what can what is this section of the software supposed to do? And you could have even have each fault tree dedicated to a different module. And based on the importance of that module and the hazards associated with that module, you could determine, you know, this module is higher priority, higher risk than the others. And we need to put more time into verification uh, that the risk controls are adequate, whereas another module be, might be less critical and you can compartmentalize some of your risk uh, controls and risk verification activities based upon the hazards presented or severity of hazards presented for that particular module. I hope that helps you. As I said below, we're gonna include in the device description, or sorry, the video description down below in YouTube, we're going, going to include the link for Matthew's video on what is 62304, a link to IEC um, 62304 to purchase from evs.ee, the AAMI link um, for 8002-1, which is the subject of this. And if you have an AAMI membership, you can buy it for $145 big discount, more than half the, or less than half the price that it would normally be from other sites. And last but not least, I'll provide a link to the blog that I'm publishing today. I hope that helps everybody. And it's um, if you have any additional questions related to software validation or software hazard analysis, please contact us. The link will be provided below. Have a great day. Bye-bye.